Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Dan Meyer. I'm editor-in-chief of RCR Wireless News. Thanks for joining us today. Today I am joined by Mick Conrad, who is the Vice President of Cloud and Strategic Alliances at Sonus Networks. Mick, thanks for joining us today. We, we appreciate it. Well, thank you very much for having me. Great. Well, uh, today we're going to talk a bit about uh, virtualization. That's a, a space that uh, that Sonus plays in quite a bit. But uh, maybe start our start our first with just having you give, I guess, maybe an overview for those who don't know much about Sonus, kind of how you guys play in the space and how you guys uh, what you guys offer. Great. So Sonus started out about 17 years ago as a media gateway company and really revolutionized the voice over IP peering and interconnect industry. And that's one of the reasons that a lot of you out there have bundled minutes and can make long distance calls to anybody for free versus 15 years ago when everybody got charged 10 cents a minute to just call their grandmother. That's all your fault. That's good. All right. Yeah, good that's great. Yeah. Right. So market leader in that space. Uh, had a had a couple problems in the you know, late 2000s, but has come back strong over the last five years in the session border control uh, industry. We're a market leader now in SBCs. Uh, SBCs are an application as well as an appliance that provide interworking and security for people that are interested in doing SIP and as well as H.263 voice over IP audio and video connections. Uh, primarily, the service provider market is a bigger market for SBCs, but there's a very strong enterprise market also. And Sonus has, uh, as we've evolved over the last four years and gained momentum in this space, uh, we were tr traditionally a service provider, uh, service provider company, and that was our core market. But we've really expanded recently and have a very strong enterprise customer base. And we've taken that momentum and have now moved Sonus and our technology really into the next stage, which is what I think you know, we want to talk about here today, which is how do we help companies, service providers as well as enterprises, as they move forward in this new world of virtualization and even future from that cloud. Yeah, yeah obviously yeah, it's, it's been a huge topic. I know I've talked to a lot of companies on the virtualization space. It seems like one of those uh, areas that has really gained a lot of momentum, like you said, over the past uh, 6, 12 months or so. Uh, and obviously you guys are taking advantage of that as well. So I guess maybe uh, a general view from, from Sonus on uh, kind of, you know, I guess the move towards virtualization. How important is it uh, for the industry? Uh, how, do you, how do you see the, the mobile industry as, as, I guess, adopting this? I mean, how important is it? And, and how, has, how, has the, how has the virtualization move, I guess, gone from your, your point of view? Yeah, so a lot of people that we've talked to, uh, and I'm going to talk, I'm going to focus primarily on the service provider side of the market, yep. because I think that's what's 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 most pertinent to the to uh, the people yep. watching this video. Uh, but in the service provider market, the virtualization has really been a game changer, uh, and is expected to be going forward. Uh, the the reason for this is that really it's it's you can think of virtualization as just a different uh, way of deploying the application that you have today. In Sonus's case, we have a session border controller, and we also have something uh, that we've that we've had for a few years called the policy server. The policy server works with the session border controller to make sure that audio and video sessions traversing through a service provider network uh, are allowed and can be stopped or started or uh, stopped at 5 p.m. or routed to a particular trunk group or from a particular mobile subscriber or not allowed to, to a particular mobile subscriber. Uh, and that's been available for years, but the difference now is that as service providers move to the world of uh, LTE, IMS, and voice over LTE, they're transforming their networks to start bringing their costs down because it's now available. Five years ago, virtualization was available, but it wasn't as accessible and it wasn't as tried and true, especially for somebody like a service provider that has to get to five nines reliability. People, we've gotten over that hump and all the early adopters are moving, we've crossed that chasm and now the, the early majority are coming in. And that's what we're seeing probably over the last year. As, as you said, Dan, what you're, you're, there's a lot of interest now over the last year. And I think it's because we've crossed that chasm. And everybody's looking at this new deployment model to really lower their costs and allow them to offer services to their customers that they couldn't before. I draw the analogy to, again, back in Sonus's history about 15 years ago, uh, voice over IP revolutionized and, and carriers adopting a backbone network that was voice over IP, revolutionized their cost structure. And because it revolutionized their cost structure, I brought it down, it allowed them to offer services to consumers at a much lower cost and really revolutionized for me and you the ability to make a phone call. And the same thing's happening now in the virtualization world. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's been a, a, a big change. And obviously, like you said, you know, the Volte coming online and just the, the increased amount of data that consumers are using, whether it's through LTE or whatever it is, uh, it seems like that this being able to monitor uh, these networks and, and be able to manage these networks has become so much more important nowadays. That seems like uh, a huge growth opportunity for you guys. Well, I guess, you know, again, what you guys offer does seem like a product that uh, seems you know, maybe tailor-made for virtualization, really. I mean, again, you know, it's software, it's, it's, out, it's something that you can kind of uh, deploy rapidly across the network. Uh, I, I guess, how do you guys look at, you know, deploying your own product uh, in the virtualized space? It does seem like a, a pretty, pretty easy process from the outside, obviously, but I'm sure from your guys' point of view, there's definitely a lot of work involved as well. Yeah, there's always a lot of work when you uh, deploy into a service provider network. I mean, just the reliability aspect and the scalability aspect and the performance of your software. And that's something that we've done at... Uh, some of some of the people watching us might be aware of the uh, re the press release that went out recently and some new products that we're bringing to market, which uh, build on the our tried and true policy server, as well as a product that we uh, acquired relatively recently, the DSC, which is a diameter controller. Mm -hmm. These routing products have both been virtual or, or one are being virtualized, uh, and it's going to allow our customers to take these. V very robust, very reliable applications that worked on dedicated appliances and now bring them as they migrate their network and evolve to a virtual setting to bring our applications forward with them and allow them to do things uh, like uh, in the case of our poly, our PSX, our policy server, uh, dynamically expand and reduce the size of their deployment uh, as their supply, as their supply and demand of sessions changes. Uh, they don't need to wait for somebody from Sonus to come and deploy something or or not deploy something. They can now very dynamically go up and down. Um, from a diameter perspective, very similar, right? So now if you're in the LTE world and you're starting to take a lot more diameter dips and you need a, a policy router to control them all, our diameter router can be that that piece of software and it can sit in the middle of your network and because it's virtual uh, you don't need to stock specific boxes it can be installed on any commodity server and it can go up and down and scale with the service provider as their business scale so to your point earlier as this deluge of mobility data uh, and, vo and voice and video sessions running on top of that data start to hit their network um, they can now say well I'm going to go to Saunas and I'm going to scale my network for average usage and then eventually as things move, move up and down from a usage perspective I'm going to I'm going to take more compute power and allocate it to my diameter router and let my diameter router go ahead and handle the more traffic that comes in and then you know scale that back as needed. Yeah, yeah. I I guess looking at the market right now I mean where are we in terms of uh, the ability for operators uh, to handle this, this you know, obviously increased data load. I mean, it seems like you know, carriers for years have been talking about this growing demand, uh, and it seems like a lot of uh, the back office systems uh, perhaps were not uh, prepared to handle what's been going on. Does it seem like you know, are, are we still in the sweet spot where operators can still, I guess, manage to stay ahead of uh, of managing their networks uh, and not get, not fall too far behind? I mean, I know there's been issues in the past where networks have. You know, there's been some signaling issues in the past that perhaps have taken down uh, certain networks at, at times. Uh, but is it, does it seem like operators are staying on top of the game when it comes to being able to manage this? And are they working with your partners like your, like yourself and being able to stay on top of, uh, you know, obviously this, this huge, huge uh, data demand? Yeah. So you know, what we're what we're seeing is that in general, the the short answer to your question is yes, they are. Okay. Um, everybody out there realizes, uh, at least all the service providers that, that we are dealing with. Uh, realize that they have to be prepared and they can't just wing this. <laughs> um, and some of them have had teams working on this. We have, we have, uh, uh, and not just not just what you would consider traditional service providers like AT&T or Verizon, but also some uh, cable companies, right, uh, that are moving into this space and are sort of peripherally. They're not necessarily mobile providers, mm -hmm. but they're they're seeing the data across their networks. Also, they are also taking a look at this. Um, and so everybody is, is they have teams of architects and we are dealing with a lot of these people right now uh, to look forward to say how do we deploy this and how do we get ready for 2015, 2016, 2017 as things go up the stack. Uh, but, but truthfully right now I think most service providers that we deal with have and, and they've been doing what you know people have been doing for the last decade have enough bandwidth and are throwing more bandwidth in any problems that they have. And that's sort of the the plan A 
throw yeah. bandwidth at it. And it's working for right now, and it has worked, I think, for the last decade. They all do understand, though, that at some point, somebody somebody's going to stop doing that, and whoever stops doing that first at scale is going to be able to have a better and let's bring it down to consumer terms, right? They're going to have to have they're going to have they're going to be able to offer a better data plan. They're going to be able to offer more voice minutes. They're going to be able to offer video uh, on, for free or tethering for free. Um, and whoever does that first and has enough of a head start in their network to be able to do that is going to win. And it's going to take market share, right? And so everybody sort of understands that. So everybody's working towards that so that they aren't left behind as this happens. Yeah, that's interesting. You're right. I mean, it does seem like the market to this point has been, you know, throw more towers, throw more spectrum. We'll handle it that way. But uh, but you're right. At some point, you know, spectrum uh, is a finite resource. Uh, there's only so many, so many places you can put towers. Uh, there's only so much back calls. There's only so much you can do. Yeah. Uh, the, it comes to, yeah, it comes to a point, too, where eventually you have to kind of get smarter about this and, and take the next step. But, the, but it does seem like, though, I mean, a lot of operators have a lot of legacy operations, which perhaps are uh, maybe slowing down their adoption. I mean, uh, some of the bigger guys do have a lot of, you know, legacy uh, circuit switch surfaces out there. Uh, so it does seem like, you know, but again, they do have bigger resources too to maybe move forward. Uh, and, so it does seem like a bit of a challenge. Yeah, it, 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 it is. And I think a lot of them are looking at this. And that's one of the, actually, one of, other than the whole virtualization, the ability to deploy the Sonus portfolio in a virtual way, which is the future, right, and take you to, to a cloud type of deployment virtual first and then later. Uh, another of Sonus' strengths is the ability, because we've been around for the last you know, 17 years, and we are already embedded in a lot of these service provider networks, and we have the ability to take a 2G, 3G network and carry that in a hybrid fashion through to a 4G LTE world. Right? And that ability to, to straddle and help a carrier migrate their existing assets forward and not just depreciate them and get rid of them is one of is something that we provide that has been a strength and has been a reason that a lot of service providers are still purchasing or purchasing our equipment and the and the new equipment going forward because they realize that they can they can reuse some of their existing assets. Now nobody wants to be in a 2G network 10 years from now, right? So eventually that's all going to go away. But over the next few years, as you migrate all that, especially in other parts of the world where maybe you know there are there there are countries where 4G is still years away. It's it's a it's a nice solution because they know that they're protected for the future. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point too. Now, and you kind of mentioned a bit earlier too the fact that it does seem like you know we've been able to kind of I guess maybe get by the re the reliability issue when it comes to virtualization. I know that's that's you know kind of still you know talked about a little bit. And obviously as move, as moving to the cloud, uh, you know reli reliability is always going to be you know paramount for operators. We want to make sure that you no know, no matter what they do going forward that they're not losing. Uh, the reliability aspect of it. Does it seem like? It sounds like from your guys' point of view that that that, that kind of challenge has been met, and, and reliability is not uh, as big of an issue as perhaps so, it was in the past. Yeah. So there's a couple aspects to reliability. Um, you know, so we can talk about different levels of reliability. Okay. One is when you go to a virtualized network. Well, is the application that you've now taken and virtualized and running on Zen or KVM or Hyper-V? Is that application reliable in this new setting, right? As whoever architected it thought through, well, what kind of how am I how am I hyper threading uh, in, in in my diff, in my virtual environment? Do I have a thread that's just doing in the case of an SBC, just doing security? Do I have another thread that's just doing interworking? Can I do it that way so it's so even if one thread crashes and so maybe interworking isn't working? but maybe security is still working, right? Same thing with policy. If, if one thread in my virtual world dies, is that, does everything die? Or did, have I architected my software in such a way that only maybe part of the function goes back while it, while it reboots and gets back going? So, so there's an aspect to the software. Um, and Sonus has spent a lot, of t a lot of time and money over the last year figuring this out as we moved our policy server and our DIA and our diameter server to the virtual world to make sure that we figured out software architecture that works and is scalable. So that's, so that's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is as you move to a virtual world, well, is your VM, is, is, you know, if you're using VMware, if you're using Zen or you're using KVM, is that reliable? Is that redundant? Are there servers that they're running, right? So there's, and, and you have to, that's not something that Sonus will solve, but that's an architectural issue that the service provider has to be looking at. And from what I've seen, a lot of the people that we deal with are 
actually doing a very good job of assuring that. So then, so then you find yourself with this reliability at the application layer, and some of the packets are coming in. It's redundant. You have HA pairs and virtual HA pairs, and 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 that I think we've gotten to as an industry over the last couple of years, right? I'm not. I don't think every single vendor has a good solution for that yet. You know. And I think it's something the service providers need to really uh, look at, but it's it's get more and more vendors are are getting there. But then you also have to look at reliability from a network level, right? Because at the end of the day, reliability comes down to quality service and the SLA that you can give to your customer. I mean, that's that's the metric. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are doing things to assure quality service and reliability, and reliability uh, by doing things with SDN. Right, and we have a relationship with Juniper, um, where we have ta we're talking to their SDN controller, mm -hmm. so we can assure that if you, as the service provider, have a Juniper platform you're running your network over, that our virtual appliances can talk to Juniper routers and provide quality of service metrics to them and reroute flows if the SLAs aren't coming in correctly. Right, so now you've moved from the world of a virtual appliance, which has to be reliable. Um, to also avert sort of this SDN concept of a virtual network, which is now becoming more reliable. And so there's different levels of reliability, and you know, as a service provider, you have to make sure that you're you're tackling each one. And I think the the one that's the most uh, innovative at this point, and, and I think virtualization is still very cutting edge. But this whole concept that Son is an example of Son is uh, partnering with Juniper mm -hmm. to provide. A network SDN controller type functionality and quality service down through the network. I think that's a very important piece also to, to yeah. keep to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it does seem like there is a lot of partnership that that really has to happen right now. I mean, you know, because because again, operators have a lot of vendors on their networks already, and you got to make sure you operate with what's out there now. Uh, how important is, I guess, the standards part of this? Because it does seem like uh, virtualization is still. Uh, perhaps a bit of the Wild West. I mean, you know, a lot of companies are coming out with different solutions. I mean, they're all working towards the same goal, but it seems like some are going about it, you know, different angles. Uh, is, is And I know there's a lot of standards bodies that are trying to help out yeah. with this and try to, you know, bring people together. How important is the standards process to, I guess, ensure both quality but also that, uh, you know, perhaps operators are comfortable with bringing on new vendors or, or you know, bringing on different vendors to work on, on, a, on a single project? Yeah, so, I, I mean... Obviously, it's it's important, right? Interoperability in the world of telecom and networking has always been important. <laughs> you know, even if you say, you know, take a look at SIP. SIP has been a standard for how many years? Yeah. <laughs> and, and you still need an SBC to make sure you're doing interworking because if you don't have one, it probably won't work, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, you're always going to need that interoperability and interworking standards are very important to make sure that that happens. But with that said, right, if you choose the right vendor that's done the interworking and has something, in, in the case of Sonos again, that's flexible enough with some of our message manipulation and some of our rules to be able to overcome any of the gaps in the standards, well, you know, then you're covered for the future. But back to your to your main question of how does, how important are standards and, and, and where are they going? My impression is that the hyper, the virtualization, the hypervisor environments are somewhat standardized. If you, as a service provider, are doing KVM, you're doing Zen, you're doing Citrix, you're doing Hyper-V, that works, right? And if I, as a vendor, tell you I'm hyper, um, I'm Hyper-V compliant or I'm KVM compliant, most likely there will not be any issues, and that will work. You should okay. still do some testing, right? That will work. Where where the standards are still evolving are in the other aspects I've touched on in this in this interview, which is the cloud aspect, things like OpenStack and orchestration layers, mm -hmm. right? So it's not so much moving to a virtualized network and, and having an instance or six instances that you can manually start and stop, but when but when you want to automatically start and stop 30 instances and scale your traffic as with demand in some automated fashion. That's where the standards are still somewhat evolving. Um, I wouldn't call it quite a wild west. It's you know, but it's it's calming down. But there's still work to be done there. Um, and then on the SDN side, you know, there's still work being done there in the in the virtual network side, right? Mm -hmm. So this concept of virtualization and cloud, there's many different aspects to it. Each aspect has its own level of standards and its own level of maturity. Uh, I'd say that the, that the basic hypervisor running an instance on a hypervisor is the most mature, and then you go down 
down and get more and more Wild West, the further down that, 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 that stack you go. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess maybe looking forward a bit then. I mean, how important uh, is it to kind of get these things obviously solved? I'm sure obviously, it's a big part of it. But I mean, I guess what challenges do you see the industry having uh, when it comes to, I guess, further uh, development and deployment of uh, virtualization of cloud uh, for at the at the operator level? Is, yeah. are, are there big challenges that still have to be tackled? And what do you see as being kind of those big ch those big challenges? So I think a lot of operators are. Or still have to, and I'm going to take it down to the basic level, right? We are working. I'm giving. I can't mention names. But we are working with some some providers that want to use our virtualized PSX and our virtualized SBC, and but they're they're still getting hung up on things like how do I implement VMware in my network or how do I get KVM working in my network, right? Because their architecture teams are just not experienced yet in that in that level, right? So even though the document, it's, it's very relatively well understood as an industry how to implement VMware, how to implement KVM, service providers still have to migrate their networks to that type of infrastructure, right? So and I'm seeing issues there. Uh, then, when, but even uh, those are overcome eventually, right? It takes a few months and people start to learn how to use that. Then you get to the next level of, okay, great. I've got this nice hyper, uh, hypervisor environment and now I got to get into OpenStack. How does that work? And then, then you run into issues there, right? Yeah. Because how does that work? How do I overlay that? And then, um, and then, and then you get the applications working. And then there's how do the packets work in a virtual network and and understanding a virtual routing environment, right? So there, there, those are the gotchas that people run into. And then at the very macro level, this is at the at the I think at the C level suite of of service providers, uh, people are trying to decide and. Do we go with a to, to a public cloud and just try to sort and, and and use the flexibility and scale of a public cloud like an Amazon or a Google or a Microsoft Azure, or do we do our own and and are responsible for our own KVM and our own OpenStack instances and and work that ourselves, or are we going to some sort of half private, half public cloud? And which one's the most cost effect will give us the biggest dip, differentiation? Two years from now, as we work through all this, and that that decision is at may, being made at the highest level, and then it's all those other problems sort of flow down from there, depending on which route people are taking. Now, from what I've seen, most service providers are taking the we're going to own this and we're going to we're going to we're going to do this soup to nuts ourselves. Some of them are going to a, to a a hybrid environment where they're leveraging certain aspects of a public cloud, potentially just storage, mm -hmm. right? Uh, whereas, but all the compute workloads are still being held in their own data center because that's, they want to own those applications and monitor them and have their own knock, right? And so that that is, I think, where it's going to be the most, to me personally, it's the most interesting to see how the industry evolves in terms of use of public cloud versus private cloud versus the hybrid cloud. And the technology, it's going to come in after that, but which I, in my belief is which model you as a service provider, you focus on is going to determine your profitability as well as your what you have to do from a uh, marketing and target perspective, because a public cloud will give you certain uh, reach in geographies and that a private cloud won't, or that a, that your own cloud will. Right. So it, it's going to be very interesting how this all plays out over the next five years. Yeah, that's an interesting part. I mean, again, these are these are huge decisions that are being made. Pretty much as we speak, on on decisions that are going to really impact how these operators uh, are, you know, are going to operate going forward. I mean, that's the interesting part about this. It seems that you know, this is an, these, are, these are big decisions, uh, new technologies uh, that are really going to shape the the telecom space over the next, like you said, five ten years. I mean, this is really going to set people up, and these are decisions that are being made now. And yeah. at the same time, operators are having to deal with, you know dealing with this data demand and bulky services. I mean, it's an interesting time right now, obviously, for, for the telecom operators to really have to, to handle all this stuff going on. And obviously, and always trying to trim costs. And, you know, it's, it's a lot happening right now. Yeah. And the one, actually, but the one thing, I mean, just not to scare anybody watching this, <laughs> um, the one nice thing about virtualization is that it gives you the flexibility. So if you're a big service provider in the United States or in, in Europe, right, yeah. and, and you have decided you're going to do your own private cloud, and you built out your data center, and, and you've gone down the path, and you bought some Sonus virtualized software, and you're putting a PSX and an SBC and a diameter router in your cloud, and 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 then you decide three years from now, oh man, you know, the prices from Amazon have gotten really cheap. I can never compete with that. 
let me it we are working and I don't know if others are but we are working to make sure we will work on those public clouds so then you just take what you have and then you can it's not going to be yeah I'm not telling you this is easy right <laughs> but there is an option to to shift your 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 workloads from your private cloud to a public cloud right yeah so it's not it's not as if my god I've I've invested all this money in a private cloud and I'm done you can shift right yeah, but yeah. and that's one of the joys of the cloud architecture it allows you to shift or at least even maybe some workloads off to a public cloud but sure. again that is a future conversation because that's not something anybody, <laughs> including Sonus, is is you know telling people to do right now. Yeah. Well, that's the beauty of software. I mean, obviously, going forward, I mean, you know, with, with, you know, people adopting more and more software and virtualization out there. Like you said, it is going to make it easier to make these switches. I mean, it's not going to be having to go in and rip out a bunch of equipment and replace equipment anymore. It's going to be just some code, and you send it out there, and boom, you can make these changes, and it's fairly painless. I mean, again, there'll be a lot of work involved, but for the most part, fairly painless. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, let's let's put it this way. Fairly painless compared to what people have been doing for the last yes. 10 years. Yes. Will it be painless? No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and obviously, yeah, you want to make sure there's no service disruptions and things like that too. So yeah, that's there's definitely challenges, but it could be an easier process. So right, that's exactly. Yeah, you know, there's heart surgery and then there's an appendix <laughs> operation. Both are not something you want to go through, right? But yes. but if you're going to choose one, you you know which one you're going to choose. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Well, you're great. Well, Mick, hey, we definitely appreciate the insight today. And obviously, you know, this is a topic that's going to just continue to kind of unfold and become uh, more in depth as we go forward. So hopefully, we can touch base again on this. But uh, we definitely appreciate the uh, the insight today. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, we'll talk again soon. Thanks. All right, thanks.